The International Christian Embassy Jerusalem is your embassy in the heart of Israel, founded in 1980. From our headquarters in Jerusalem through our branches in over 80 nations and yours in Canada, we seek to challenge the church to take up its scriptural responsibility, to remind Israel of the promises made to her in the Bible, and to be a source of practical assistance to all the people in the land of Israel. On today's program, a report on the European Union's labeling guidelines concerning Israel, a discussion about anti-Semitism on campus, a conversation at the Quarter Cafe in Israel. and core values as ICEJ is to speak up against the anti-Semitism all across the world. That's why we are today here in Brussels, Belgium, in the European Parliament building, hosting a symposium concerning the EU labeling guidelines against Israel. We've been here together with 13 nations, representatives from ICEJ branches, and this symposium has been hosted together with the European parliamentarians, Hanno Takula and Bas Belder. There's been a massive campaign against Israel for the last 15 years, very concerted, very deliberate campaign, the boycott, the sanction, the divestment campaign. The truth is that it's very heavily funded by hostile elements in the world, Arab countries that are uh, anti-Israeli in its core. The way the European notice applies is every single Israeli product that is sold in Europe should have appropriate labeling so as to warn consumers away from products from disputed areas. It is unlawful, it is against international trade law, for example. Yes, od kima time, sikh sukhim, bekor khave aulam. Azlama, Europa khlita lakhlish, rakit Israel. The countries will not be able to sell the products that are Israeli products from disputed areas unless there's some indication to consumers um, of where, where these products are from that the European Union likes. There's a few people who lose from this policy. Um, above all, the people most impacted are the Palestinian workers. Thousands of Palestinians will most likely lose their place of employment uh, because these factories, these Israeli businesses cannot afford to exist anymore. Slowly, slowly, many people started to understand what's going on because people don't care. They just think, okay, it doesn't matter if there's some labels and so on, but they don't think about it the deeper. What is the circumstance and what it really means for the Palestinians and the Israelis? We should not forget that for Jewish peoples here in this continent, in the, in the 30s, there were at the beginning of the Holocaust with the isolating of the Jewish communities and Kauf uh, nicht bei Juden, don't buy uh, Jewish products in the Jewish shops. I don't think they realize, or I, maybe they just don't care, uh, that they're violating the law. At the same time the European Union is advocating that we should lift sanctions from Iran. Iran, a nation that sponsors terrorism, that funds most of the, the terrorism in the Middle East. We should lift the sanctions from them. We should apply sanctions on the only democracy in the Middle East, the only nation that is a true ally of Europe and the West in the Middle East, and that is Israel. It's, 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 it's insane. The question that people always ask is, what can they do? And sometimes it's very intimidating. You look at a building like the European Parliament, it's very, it's huge, it's intimidating, there's a lot of power, and, and you feel that your voice is, is insignificant. And as Christians, we have to remember that our voice matters. Our voice matters above all before the throne of God that he hears us, that we have access to the throne room of the King of Kings. So get involved, find your church, find a prayer group, find a way to engage in prayer for Israel. Israel has never needed your prayers more than it does today. Your voice also matters in, in the halls of power, 
that, that every politician is elected and they're elected by voters. And, and if voters write to them or call them or show an interest in what they're doing, they will listen. It's very valuable, it's more than valuable, it's priceless to have uh, big communities, powerful communities like your organizations and other organizations and other countries as well uh, that can stand out and we, we can show that our interests align together and form kind of a united front because uh, that speaks volumes. We just want to say thank you to our supporters and friends for enabling us in our fight against the anti-Semitism. Up next, anti-Semitism on campus. Bill and Marianne, can you tell us how anti-Semitism is being manifested on campus? The, the only really good information we have, or the best information in Canada, is provided by this report, the Canadian Parliamentary Coalition to Combat Anti-Semitism. It was put out in 2011, so it's a little out of date, but it was prompted by noticing the resurgence of anti-Semitism in Europe and in Canada. And um, this group, was composed of um, sitting and uh, former members of parliament from all three parties, conservative, liberal, and New Democratic Party. Uh, it was not uh, a report from the government. And it set out to uh, describe and to define anti-Semitism in Canada, to examine its extent, and to make good practical recommendations about how to deal with it. It's an interesting reading. Most of these reports aren't, but this one is actually interesting to read. It um, differentiates or it, it expands on the idea of traditional anti-Semitism, which was discrimination and hatred of Jews as a group. And it goes on to talk about the new anti-Semitism, which is more um, the role of the state of Israel in the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians in the Middle East. And it includes that as part of anti-Semitism, but it makes it very clear that um, to criticize Israel is not in itself anti-Semitic. If it's treated in the same way that criticism of other countries is done, it's not anti-Semitic. But if they single out Israel and demonize, discriminate against Israel, and use a double standard, then it's considered anti-Semitism. So within that context, they really looked broadly at anti-Semitism in Canada. We can't begin to cover what they found here. Our main uh, focus, our interest, was on the academic side, and a lot of the report is uh, on that. Uh, there have been several reports that show that Jewish students on campus, uh, a, a large majority of them, uh, suffer from harassment and even violence against them, uh, generally by uh, various um, uh, anti-Israel uh, or uh, uh, Palestinian groups. Um, and it's a problem, it's been a problem on this campus in the past. Uh, it's, it's a problem also in the relationship of, of not just Jewish students, but any student uh, with a professor. Um, if the Jewish student or, or an ordinary student happens to um, put forward a point of view that is um, uh, supportive of Israel or even neutral as far as the Israeli-Palestine situation is concerned. Um, we were speaking a couple of days ago to a woman who in 2002 was in peace studies at McMaster University um, uh, and wrote an, uh, an article uh, that was related to the foundations of, of, of Israel, not, neither for nor against, just giving factual um, information, and uh, she got an F. And she went through all the appropriate procedures um, and she had to camp out on the door of the president of McMaster University in order to get redress, finally. Uh, we, we know, and that was years ago. And that was years, that was ago. years that was, ago. That was 13 years ago. And we, and we know another student uh, who, about three or four years ago, had the same experience. 
He went directly to the president of the university, did get redressed, but he was told he shouldn't have done it. It's really totally inappropriate for professors to use their classrooms to indoctrinate students with their own ideology. Certainly not all professors do that. I don't intend to convey that, but there are certain areas in which it's pretty rampant at some of the universities. And so not only are Jewish students intimidated and ridiculed if they speak up and give another point of view, but the other students are being cheated of an education where they learn to think critically and to assess information and to have open discussion of uh, conflictual information. Can you give us some examples on how you've seen anti-Semitism manifested on campus against the Jewish students and the impact? It depends on the campus. It's certainly much more at some than others. And it's certainly heightened, it seems, when there are demonstrations or protests or events like Israeli Apartheid Week or uh, even um, meetings to look at uh, BDS. Uh, we'll talk about that another time. But, or if there are things going on in the world, particularly the Middle East, like last summer um, in the uh, Gaza um, and Israeli conflict, this intensifies it. But there seems to be a level at which, well, students, Jewish students have reported they don't want to wear kippahs or stars of David. They feel like, you know, they don't want to draw attention to themselves, it's not safe. Uh, they get spit on, they get called really nasty, what you would expect. Um, so it's not an everyday experience, I think, for Jewish students. But if they go to any of the events or near the events that are occurring that are pro-Palestinian, then you can pretty be, be pretty sure you're going to get. Uh, I became interested in this issue um, because I, I realized that uh, Israel um, uh, was all alone. Uh, if Israel went down, if Israel was allowed to be run over by its uh, Arab and Muslim uh, neighbors, then um, the rest of us would go too. Because the only way that that could happen would be by a failure of will on the part of the Western world, a failure on the part of the Western world to um, recognize the democratic and uh, free society that we live in, uh, that has given us the prosperity that we have, to recognize that Israel is one of us, um, and it, it's, uh, in, in my opinion, essential that we defend Israel and um, fight anti-Semitism any way we can. Can Israel is the canary in the coal mine. Some of the things we've tried to do on the McMaster campus is we have brought in speakers. Um, we brought in uh, Tammy uh, Rossman Benjamin last year who plays a very big role in fighting for the, the, the help, the, sorry, the safety of Jewish students on the California campuses where it's really quite rampant anti-Semitism. And I think her, uh, we had her meet with the president of the university. Um, we have, but getting back to the report, we have made two attempts to try to get both our university president here and then a collection of university presidents to look at and consider the recommendations. So there were five recommendations in, in this report. Uh, that related specifically to anti-Semitism on campus. The, the first uh, recommendation was that the, um, the uh, universities collectively should get together through their organizations, and in Ontario, that's the Council of Ontario Universities, COU, that, that they should get together um, and uh, formulate a policy with respect to anti-Semitism, Israel Apartheid Week, boycott, divest, sanction movement, uh, and, and so forth. This was their first recommendation in, in, in that area, and um, nothing was done. It certainly done. didn't happen spontaneously. We, we wrote a letter to the, to the COU um, earlier this year um, requesting that they consider this issue. Um, 
And we got back a polite response saying that it was too hard, basically. Well, they did. They did actually. They, we they, think they, they, they brought the recommendation, but the universities wish to individually right. deal with it. And our thinking was, and I, I think it's a very hard role to be a university president and to take a stand. But I think a stand has to be taken. And if they would do it in a unified way, there'd be much more chance that the pushback it, it would be much easier. Be as it would be much easier for the right. COU to take a position than it would be for any individual uh, university. And, and that's why this report had that as its first recommendation. Mm -hmm. But it did also recommend that um, presidents of universities uh, st use their right of free speech and stand up and condemn all anti-Semitism. The, 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 the government of Ontario, for heaven's sakes, has condemned Israel Apartheid Week, but to my knowledge, no university in this province um, has had the intestinal fortitude to stand up and exactly. say, IAW is a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean but, that the, it's not a question of free speech no, at all. They, they hide behind the free speech issue. It's not a question of free speech. They're perfectly free to hold IAW on campus, but uh, you, to judge from the way the universities deal with it, it's perfectly all right. It's as though they have no moral responsibility to the students. And I would suggest that if any other identifiable group on campus, whether it's women or blacks or mm. Indians, natives. Um. Earlier, earlier this year, uh, there was a, an engineering group that, that said <laughs> yes. various misogynistic things about women. And, and in their songbook. In their songbook. Um, it, it, it got into the press, it got to the notice of somebody or another. The next day, they were zap, gone. That student group? But but, but if a student group, and, and this often happens uh, uh, with the Muslim Student Association, for example, had, had said bad things about, about uh, Israel uh, and, and suggesting that, 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 that the Jews should go. Hateful things. Hateful really? things. Um, it, nothing would happen. I mean, so there's, there's a clear double standard. Up next, a conversation at the Quarter Cafe. Well, I'm here with uh, my friend Uzi at his restaurant in the Jewish Quarter, and you've got to take a look at this view. It is stunning. You see the Mount of Olives. You see the Temple Mount. You see everything here just right below. And I've eaten here beautiful, fresh food. Uzi, tell me about how did you get involved in this restaurant you said your dad's built or started in 1975 and you got involved in 79 but it's tucked away it's not a, it's not a restaurant it's a destination restaurant because you wouldn't necessarily just walk past it and find it as if it were on the main main street or on the cardo or uh, it was not in the main street it, it was in the main street when the cardo was not found until uh, yeah. 1989 See, when they open it. Now the cardo took the, the but this is the path to, is going to the western wall, so yes. people must, uh, uh, most of it we are working with uh, tourism, with uh, uh, agency, the tourism agency, with uh, people who are already know us. Uh, this, is the, this, this year was the first time that I made a bar mitzvah for the son who I met Bar Mitzvah to his father a long time ago. <laughs> so you understand? So, so I mean, a second generation Second bar, generation that, start that's to... That's terrific. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the Bar Mitzvahs are down, Bar Mitzvahs and Bar Mitzvahs are on a regular t uh, schedule at the Western Wall, aren't they? About two or three times a week? No, no, there are two times a week, times Monday a week. and Thursday, and, and, and of course Shabbat. Yes. A Saturday, but Saturday we are closed. So the, these two days, it's, yeah. Now, I, I read something interesting, Uzi, is that this, this top floor that we're on that gets the better view wasn't here when Walter Cronkite was here. Is that correct? Exactly. And he, re he broadcast. Yeah. And that was, what was the year for that? Uh, Walter Cronkite broadcast here in 1977 when the peace process started with the Egypt. 
and yes. he came to make a, a view on Israel. So he, one of the spots that he took, uh, I think it was a large review that he made from here uh, to the CNN. He was walking, I think, in CNN, yes. And he took it from downstairs because this level was not uh, uh, yet. And also the, the other, no, no, most of the houses here was not here in 1977. Also the, the yeshiva was not here, so you could oh, I see, see. You oh. could see a, a big angle of, of, the, of the view from here. Did you meet him? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I think I have some uh, a signature from him then in oh, really? I don't know where but have you had other um, newscasters or anchors come to to appreciate the view? Yes, yes, many uh, politicians, singers uh, I think most most people who came famous one just uh, arrived, not said, not yeah. a, but just arrived to see the view and passed to the uh, and go to the Western Wall. Many people, yes. And you said this is a place in the city where everything happens. You can see the activity from whether the, from all over. All over. All over. This, uh, the Jewish quarter started in the, in the 70s. It was half and a half religion and non-religion. Who, until 1977, who could buy a house in the Jewish quarter was uh, by two critters. One, it was lived before 48 in the Jewish quarter, and he get back to his house, like uh, you saw the old houses in the beginning, and who was Israeli resident and uh, served in the army until 1977. Since 1977, it was open market. So they start to sell and uh, the houses to everyone. So most of the people who came in the, this time was in start the inflation in Israel. So most of the people uh, was from United States, Jewish or non-Jewish, they, they bought a lot of houses here. And then, and then they make Aliyah. And since then it's more religious more religious and today it's much more religious that i i know it from the beginning and then you have of course the arab section and you have the armenian section and you have at least the the, the christian there because it's a little bit far from the uh, jewish quarter but the armenian they are christian also but they we are most in the armenian uh, involved in the armenian and the muslim ones and yes, it's up and down, and uh, we feel we feel much before the situation who, where it's going to. If you have like before 2000, the, all the intifada, the second intifada, we knew it before it, half year before it. It was many reasons. Uh, they said the trigger was uh, when Sharon went to the to the to the Temple Mountain. Maybe it was a trigger, but it, this is, was not the reason. The reason start much before, much before. And uh, yes, you, you, you can see even, even this, the clashes that you have on the mountains from time to time, the strong, the true strongs, or do you see that the, the soldiers came on the, uh, on the policemen? You can see it from here. So many news uh, come to so. Broadcast from here. When you were talking about the uh, first intifada, um, that's when 50% of the Jews were not coming here, but the evangelical Christians were. And we second. host, uh, ICJ hosts the annual Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, mm -hmm. the fest festival of booze, and we were coming year after year. And the hotels and the restaurants would open up for us. They would be very thankful and they would cry when we leave because... Exactly. And that was a very tough time for all of you. And yet you've been here almost 40 years. So you have staying power <laughs> and I've eaten here and it's very, very fresh food. And the view you is like second to none mm -hmm. anywhere in the world. And you so Uzi, no. it's great being here with you. Is there anything like you would like to say to us or Canadian viewers? Yes, first of all, 
you are welcome anytime, anytime. Not just in the West that you are support us, or even when it's become nice, easy, comfortable, you are welcome every time and we are not forget what you've done for us, really. So the message is, is I hope it will be peace. But if not, we are together and mm -hmm. we can run the place for you or welcome every time. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. We conclude our program today with some sights and sounds within Israel. Thank you for joining us today and be sure to visit our website at www.icejcanada.tv or call us at 1-866-324-9133. One hundred percent of what we receive from you toward a project goes to that designation. Through your contribution to ICEJ Canada, you can participate by giving to Haifa Home for Holocaust Survivors, Women at Risk Red Carpet Project, Operation Life Shield Bombproof Shelters, Shoulder to Shoulder Alias Support, Bet Singer Children's Home, Israel in Crisis, ICEJ Communication Media Fund, Christian Friends of Yad Vashem, Megan David Adam Emergency Services, Canada Israel Young Adult Scholarship, Equip and Teach, Bet Rachel Strauss Inclusive Community, Gift Estate and Securities Funds.